Thank you, Timothy. You can hope you all can hear me. Um, thank you for the invitation to share God's word this morning on the subject of a new citizenship taken from First Peter, <clears throat> chapter two. Uh, I bring to you via Zoom the greetings, Christian greetings from the folks at uh, DDDI Gospel Center. Ever since the reimposition of the MCO uh, a few Sundays ago, we have returned completely to the Zoom. Uh, since November, we have been having a hybrid. Uh, some of us, uh, 30 hours at the church of our renovated building and the rest at home. Nonetheless, I think um, it's important for us as uh, the Lord's people as we gather as a church separately, uh, yet we are one in Him and that we will all make our homes or wherever, wherever we are, as we have, if, we have, if we have tuned in to the services, that the place that we are right now is God's sanctuary, even though we can't meet uh, collectively in person in, in the church building and, and, and the premises and so on. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> can we turn to the Bible? I hope you have your Bibles. You, uh, you should be having your Bibles and we are at home. So you, you, can't, I, you can't say you can't, you can't bring your Bibles. <laughs> uh, First Peter chapter 2, we'll read from verse 9 till verse 12. I'm reading from the uh, NIV. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now... You are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. <clears throat> Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for this privilege, despite the fact that we can't gather in person in the various churches during this particular time of human history. And the pandemic is really affecting every facet of life. But we thank you that we are gathered in our various homes, and we are united through Christ, and that we are one in him, despite being separated in various localities. Thank you this morning that you have reminded us to turn our eyes upon Jesus, to think about his love. And most of all, before we even partook of the emblems to survey the wondrous cross on which he died, and to be reminded of the love, which is so amazing, so divine, which demands our life and our all. Now, Father, as we look into your word, as we ponder on what has been said by the Apostle Peter so many centuries ago of who we are, we pray, Lord, that your spirit will speak to us, that your spirit will draw lessons for us, even this morning hour. I ask, Lord, for your spirit's anointing and unction to be able to share your word, that you speak through me to all of us, and that we not only will hear a word, but be doers of the word as well. Lord, we ask for your blessing upon us, and that your presence will be with us, because we wait upon you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Identity is important. It is who you are. It is who I am. So who are we? How do we identify ourselves when we meet somebody or when we are asked to introduce ourselves? Male, female, that's all, two categories. No third category or fourth. Son, daughter, father, mother, grandfather, grandmother, rich, poor, school dropout or university graduate, employed, employer, jobless, retired, and so on. And I'm sure many of you would recall that prior to GE14, when you travel abroad, many of you would have been reluctant to say that you are Malaysian. 
because of the man who says cash is king. Um, mm-hmm. So none of you would like to be identified with him. Uh, and so some of you say you're Singaporeans, or you're Indonesian Chinese, or Thai Chinese, and so on. <laughs> Hope not. But nonetheless, identity is important. The world demands that you identify yourself according to these categories. But is that really who we are as Christians, as the Lord's people? The sum total of our body parts, our skin color, our language, our culture, and whatnot? Not according to God, not to what we have read in First Peter chapter 2. In the scripture passage that we are going to consider this morning, the Apostle Peter helps us to discover or rediscover for some of us, in fact, our Christian identity. Not that we are card-carrying members of the church, so of Bangsa Gospel Center or of DDDI. You know, we don't issue cards. So nobody knows who we are, actually, in a sense. So we are, to dis- we are trying to dis- rediscover our Christian identity today. First, to know what it is. And then, importantly, most importantly, to live it. So what are the distinguishing characteristics of the people of God which separate us from the world? Now, in this chapter 2, Peter has been talking about how Christ is the capstone, the foundation of the house of God. The world did not receive him. They rejected him. They stumbled over him. He came as a servant when they were expecting a king. He came to suffer, suffer on the cross when they were expecting a conqueror to uh, liberate them from the Roman yoke or the, the Roman conquerors. So the Jews rejected him at his coming. So has the rest of the unbelieving world, the believing world, believing world today, uh, so has the rest of the unbelieving believing world today rejecting him and stumbling over what we have to say about him? And Peter says that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8, the preceding verse, a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message. Now, this is not true for us believers. In verse 9, Peter begins with the conjunction. If you are an expert in the English language or a teacher of the English language, the conjunction, but, which is to introduce a statement contrasting with what has already been mentioned. Now, but is also a preposition, a noun, adverb, and so on. But in this context, it is a conjunction. It's trying to bring a contrast for us. So Christians should be drastically different from the world. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Christ says that we are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. So we are radically different. In fact, I also believe that we are not only the salt and light, we are the city that is set on the hill. Otherwise, nobody can see us. Now, Peter encourages the believers of his day, but also to reinforce why they should continue to be different. In fact, Peter used the word um, in verse 11, Dear friends, I urge you. So he was so passionate about it, urging them to live as strangers and aliens and to abstain from sinful desires. So it's a strong reminder from Peter who they are and what distinguishes them. Now, as we go through this text, these few verses um, this morning, it may be a challenge to some of us to continue to remain different, but we have to take it seriously, to continue to not compromise at the workplace or in the community. For others, it may be a call to repent from the ways we have compromised and conformed to this world for so, such a long time, perhaps. So the question I put to you as we begin, which I want you to put at the back of your mind, there are many questions that we've raised. First, can the world tell that we are different? Or we look same like them. We are a clone of, of the world. No difference. You know, if you, if you were to go to Korea uh, in now, you find that almost every Korean man and woman look alike. They've all gone for plastic surgery. You just have to tune into uh, Astro, the Korean, Korean dramas and movies. You know? Sometimes you can't distinguish which actor or actress is acting. They, almost, they look almost the same. 
So you can't tell the difference at times. So can the world tell that we are different? Now we're going to see six descriptions that should mark us out as believers as we walk on this earth. Christ left us in this world for a purpose. And these are the six descriptions that Peter has sought to, to bring to, to the minds of the, of the believers of his time and to us as well today. So the next, so as we go through this description, the next question we should ask ourselves, are we living out these realities in our lives? Do we live out these differences? Now, firstly, chosen people. Peter says we are a chosen people. Peter uses this terminology, which is commonly used in reference to Israel. Deuteronomy 7.6 describes Israel. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. So in the same way, Israel was called to be God's chosen people on the earth and to be witnesses for him. The church is now God's chosen people. This choosing is not because we are better than others or because we, you know, we are small in number, but it is totally of God's grace, totally of God's work of grace. Paul, the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 4 to 6, he says that he chose us before the creation of the world. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. I know the subject of predestination is a very complicated subject, but we will not deal with it at this juncture. We can, we can talk about it as a separate subject. Maybe your elders can take it on as a separate issue. But what Paul is trying to say that he has chosen us to the praise of his glorious grace, which has given us in the one he loves. So this choosing is all to the praise of God's glorious grace and his unmerited favor to mankind. And this chosen by God to receive salvation and to enjoy him forever. So we are a chosen people. Secondly, a royal priesthood. We are called to be this category of uh, people as believers. Now for a Jewish audience, this would stand out as rather quite strange in that sense. In the Old Testament, the monarchy and the priesthood were strictly separated. Priests came from the lineage of Aaron, from the tribe of Levi. Only they could approach God at the temple to offer the sacrifices. The rest of the Jews could not. The priests represented them. The king was special in Israel because he was anointed with oil by the priest. So that is to equip him and empower, to be empowered by God to do the task of ruling Israel and fighting the battles of the Lord against the Lord's enemies in the land. So there is a strict separation of these two roles. But I'd like to bring an example of two kings who were judged by God for trying to combine the priesthood and kingship. Firstly, King Saul was anxious to go to battle. Uh, you find it recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 13. And instead of waiting for Samuel, the prophet Samuel, who is a priest himself, to come and offer a sacrifice to God, to the Lord, King Saul decided to do it himself. And because of that, <clears throat> God had to judge him. And his kingship ended very soon. Then we also have another account of another king in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, King Uzziah, who was a successful king, extraordinarily successful, and therefore became proud. He felt that because he was so great, he could burn incense in a temple. Again, it's a work specifically set apart for the priest to do. And the priests get it, confront him and said, you will not be blessed by the Lord because you have been unfaithful. King Uzziah became angry you know, at this and reached out to burn the incense and leprosy broke out on his head because God judged him. And he had to step down from being king and pass the kingship to his son. And sadly, he died a leper. So it was a serious separation of roles. 
So therefore, the privilege that we now have is unlike that during the Jewish economy of old. It is a royal priesthood that has merged two roles together. How is this possible now? The only way this is possible is because under the new covenant, there is no longer a priest who must come from a specific tribal line, no longer a priest who can represent God's people. We all are priests in the presence of God. In Hebrews chapter 7 verse 17, it's mentioned that in the new covenant, Christ, our high priest, comes from the order of Melchizedek. If you, if you read Genesis, you'll find that he was a former king and priest of Salem, whom Abraham paid tithes to. Uh, this was also prophesied in Psalm 110 verse 4 about the coming Messiah. So Christ will be a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, a kingly priest. And so we believers, as Christians, are now royal priests to, and to represent the fact or to show that we are united with Christ. We are his body and whatever glory Christ receives, we receive as well. And we are co-heirs with Christ. Romans 8, 17 says that we will reign with him eternally one day. And while here on earth, our role is to draw man unto himself and as priests to lead people in the worship of Christ. So as royalty in Christ, we fight wars. We go into battles that is king of kings of old on behalf of God's kingdom. Ancient kings would go off and fight battles. You will see in some of these movies, you know, in the interest of the kingdom, are we fighting those battles? What battles do we fight? The church should be seen tearing down the fortresses and strongholds of Satan. When you preach the gospel, you enter into enemy territory. You don't enter into the territory of the converted to preach the gospel. And Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 gives a picture of a, a, a church as a soldier putting on the armor of God, the armor of the king to go into battle. So royalty and priests. So our unique role of a priest is our intimate relationship with God. You know, in the old Jewish economy, the high priest was the only one who could enter the presence of God. And only once a year, on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And in fact, he goes in with much, with much fear and, trip, and trip, trepidation. And they had to tie a rope on his ankle in case he gets struck down by God. And no one else can go in and pull him out and pull the body out. So the rope is there for that purpose, in case he gets struck down and they can pull him out of the Holy of Holies. But today, as royal priests, we can go right into the presence of God by a new and living way. You can read in Hebrews, the veil has been torn, removed, and we can walk and talk with God personally. So we have been placed by God in a very special position in this nation, in our workplace, in the community, in our families, places where we are to play our kingly and priestly role to intercede for others or leaders to make godly decisions for strongholds to be broken and for the light of the gospel to go forth. Now as priests, we also call to teach the people. If you remember Ezra, uh, in the book of Ezra, he devoted himself to the study and the teaching of the law of God. So same thing for us as believers under the new covenant. We not only preach the gospel, you look carefully at the Great Commission in Matthew chapter uh, 28, verse 19. We are to make disciples by teaching them everything Christ commanded. So let's study the Bible. Now let it depart from our mouths. Talk about it at dinner. I know we all talk about politics more often than not. You know? Um, talk about it at work. Whenever we meet people, try to talk about it. Not that we ram the gospel down people's throat in an unreasonable and insensitive manner. We have to be careful, right? And not callous, uh, C-A-L-L-O-U-S, huh? and it's insensitive. So as priests, we are to be a teacher of the word. And the Jewish uh, fathers were, were, were exhorted, you know, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 to 9, to do that for the families, you know, they are to, to, to talk about 
or all these things to the children, impress upon them, talk about them when they sit at home, when they walk along the way, lie down, when they lie down, when they get up, everything. Also put the symbols on the hands and, and bind them on the foreheads. Of course, we don't do that today. We don't tie the phylactery on our foreheads or on our wrists or to write them on the door frames of houses and on gates. Although old Chinese houses do that, you know, the Christ, uh, but you're usually doing Chinese New Year. We should be putting verses like that. Anyway, so we are a royal priesthood and it's a privilege to be in the royal priesthood. Thirdly, a holy nation. Again, this terminology was used of Israel. In Exodus 19.6, they were called a holy nation. They were set apart by God for good works to serve him and worship him. So that's for us too. Chosen and set apart for good works. And Paul again said this in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. So often we read verses 8 and 9 of chapter 2, you know, for by grace are ye saved and so on and so forth. They forget verse 10. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, not just to come together, have good time of fellowship, have feasting instead of fasting, you know. And uh, having good fun in the church and in you know, our home groups and uh, pastoral groups or cell, cell groups, but created in Christ Jesus to good to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So we must discover what those good works are. So we forget verse ten. So when you read chapter two, verses. 8 and 9, include verse 10 as well, so that we can remember that we are a holy nation set apart for good works as well. Now the word that the Apostle Paul used here for workmanship is the Greek word poema, P-O-E-M-A, which, from which we get the English word poem. So we are God's poem, his artistry, like the way a poem is, 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 is crafted, is carefully crafted and constructed with each verb Adjective, adverb, noun, and preposition, and conjunction, and so on, to achieve a desired goal by the poet. So God has and is carefully constructing and crafting each one of us through various events in our lives, through various episodes around us, through the teaching of his word, and even trials and difficulties and persecutions for the purpose of producing good works for his glory. So God chose to display his beautiful artwork, his character, his holy character, and his good works to the rest of the world through us. Now, holiness has a positive element of righteousness or good works, but also it has that negative element where we are not to do certain things. When James chapter 1 tells us that we are to stay unspotted or free from the pollution of sin. He says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So the church is a holy nation, separated from sin, set apart for the purpose of good works. And God has chosen to call out a holy nation from his people to represent him and to serve others. Fourthly, we are a people possessed by God, people belonging to God, Peter says. The church belongs to God. It doesn't belong to any one of us, not to the elders or whoever could have been the uh, very kind philanthropist to donate a building or funds for the church. No. We are a people belonging to God. And as I read earlier on in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6, you look carefully at the verse towards the end of the verse, there are these three words, his treasured possession. So what does that mean? It means that we are not only here to serve God, but we are here for God's pleasure, for His pleasure, for His glory. You know, whatever we own, we own it for our pleasure. Okay? You have a nice car, you, you take the car nice for a nice drive, you, know, you enjoy the drive and so on and so forth. Because it gives you joy, it's yours. So the same thing, God has chosen us for the purpose of His pleasure. Now this was a phenomenal concept that... Uh, the believers at that time, you know, had to try to come to grasp with. During those times, as, as, as believers, people of the way, they were, they were called Nazarenes or people of the way. They were mocked, abused. 
rejected, ridiculed for following this crucified saviour as, as the world then also uh, sort of uh, teased them. But yet, they are owned and treasured by God. Therefore, it's imp it was important for the believers then to know how special they really were. Because if they did not, they would adopt the mindset of the world and go back to the world and conform to the world. So they needed to, be, to know that they were chosen as God's special possession in the earth. Uh, again, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, if I may refer back to Paul's epistle, and Paul says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Now mark those words, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. You will think that Paul will say our inheritance in God, meaning how special he is to us, how rich we are in him, and uh, probably we would be thinking about it this morning when we come around the Lord's table. Oh, how wonderful, you know, God is so special to us how rich we are in him. True, all that are, are true. But Paul says, his glorious inheritance in the saints. In the saints, us. We are his wealth. We are his joy and his pleasure. Now it's an immensely powerful concept that Paul prayed for the church to grasp and let us hope we can grasp. And uh, if I may refer to one more portion of scripture before we go on to the next characteristic. If you look at Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, and this is what Zephaniah said, the Lord your God is with you, is mighty to save, he will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. And note this line that's coming. He will rejoice over you with singing. Oh, now Zephaniah talks about the people of God in a language that most people are not used to hearing. God takes great delight in us. He rejoices and sings over us. Now, how many of us really understand, you knew that God sings as well? Now, this is a phenomenal concept. We are his possession, his inheritance, and God sings over us. You know, at one time we had a, a, a sister in our church who refused to sing. Uh, so we inquired why God says all women must keep silent in church. Whew. So fortunately, for, for after a while, I, I was speaking on Zephaniah. So I picked on this particular verse and uh, gave a slightly more uh, detailed explanation. Uh, and so uh, this sister began to sing again. And we hope the church will sing. Because God sings. Okay. Now, faithfully, uh, worshipping people. Now, Peter says, we are to declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Our commission is a commission to declare the praises of God. Believers have been saved from the darkness of sin and out of this world in order to be a unique people who worship God. So one of the things that should distinguish the life of a believer is a life of worship, not just a one and a half hours, two hours on a Sunday morning. That is not worship alone. A life of worship. The Apostle Paul says that's, that in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, right? That we are to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable worship, which is our worship. And this separates us from other people, groups in the world, because we have a spirit of gratitude to God for what he has done and will continue to do in our lives. And again, I like to refer to Paul in Philippians chapter 2. He says, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. What does he mean by that? He says, do everything without complaining or arguing. Why? So that we may become blameless children of God. Paul sees, Paul sees doing everything without complaining and arguing as something that, that should distinguish the children of God. It marks us as different from the world. And he also pictures this world as dark and the children of God as lights in this, and stars in the sky. We are lights because when things go wrong or are difficult, instead of being found in the garments of complaining and, and, uh, you know, uh, and arguing and, 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 and so on and so forth, you know, whining and and, and frust uh, being frustrating and sighing and so on. 
we are to be found in the garments of praise and thanksgiving. That's a song. So I'm sure you all do sing it as well. Put on the garments of praise, right? For the spirit of heaviness. We are to be different from the world because we are a worshipping community. So how is your worship? I'm not talking about the Sunday morning, you know. And this is the question that we also ask in TDI. It's not that few, the hours, a couple of hours on a Sunday morning. How is your thanksgiving? Are you holding forth your light as a child of God? Are you shining like stars? This should distinguish us as believers. He called us to worship and we must do so. Sixthly, okay, the sixth characteristic, people who have received mercy. On Peter chapter 2 verse 10, you now have received mercy. It has often been said, grace is when God gives us what we do not deserve. Mercy is when God does not give us what we really deserve. We were once a people under God's wrath because of our sin and rejection of Christ. But because of God's grace, we have now received mercy, forgiveness of sins, and have become the people of God. Uh, again, I may refer to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we, we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace we have been saved. So believers have received mercy. Now, why does Peter emphasize this? I must put two points across here. Why, why, why did Peter emphasize this mercy thing? After talking about all the wonderful things, the blessings and responsibilities of God's people, right? Chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, belonging to God, worshipping and so on. Why now talk about mercy? Now it's necessary to understand God's great mercy is particularly important so that for us, we are not to boast in God's sovereign choice of us. Yes, we are not to boast in God's sovereign choice of us, but to instead boast in God. It's not our doing that we receive mercy, right? We should not boast about it. So it's necessary to remember the depths of our sin in order to properly view God's mercy and grace. Secondly, understanding God's great mercy would also be necessary in order to be effective priests and ministers of God. I'm sure you remember Paul uh, identifying himself in 1 Timothy 1.15 as the chief of sinners. All right. Paul remembered how he received mercy. Paul actually killed Christians, persecuted them. You know, in, in, when he was on the road to Damascus, he actually came with sort of a warrant from the chief priest and high priest in Jerusalem to go and get hold of these people of the way, you know. And then bring them back and have them properly done with. But he received mercy on the road to Damascus. And so this recognition of his own terrible sin prepared him to be a proper minister of God. And this was a problem with the Pharisees. They did not see themselves as sinners and therefore misjudged everybody else. You remember the incident between the Pharisee and the publican? How he compared himself with the publican? The publican began, all he could do was to weep and pound his chest and said, God be merciful to be a sinner. Whereas the Pharisee says, no, I'm not like that fellow. You know? You know, I do all his good things. Right? So therefore, he didn't receive mercy. He didn't go back to his house justified, unlike the publican. So Peter tells us that we are such a privileged people, chosen by God, given great grace, called to be a royal priesthood as a minister to God, and the nations, we are a holy nation to be separate from sin and also called to a life of holiness and righteousness. And we are God's possession made to be enjoyed by him and the people who have received mercy. So let me exhort you, brothers and sisters, do not identify yourself according to the world's categories. You only do that when you fill up a form. Okay, right now we are having this Census has been taking place. And they ask you to fill up, and you just fill up, that's all. That's their categories. But we belong to God. We have a different dimension. We live in the realm of the spirit, the fifth dimension. So whatever else you might be, remember you are first 
and foremost a Christian. Right? First and foremost a Christian. No one can take that from you. That is your identity. That is my identity. That is our identity. Know it. Believe it. Cherish it. And live it. Paul said in verses 11 and 12 of chapter 2 of his, epistle, of his first epistle, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires, which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of being wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now, one of the greatest lies that Satan has sown in the church is that once you become a Christian, everything is fine. You can sing a song, hallelujah, and on, the, on the road to heaven. You know? True. In his seven, always that's true. But the struggle is not over. Peter says just the opposite. Becoming a Christian is not the end of the struggle. It's the beginning. God made us Christians. Now we are to live as Christians. Christians are to abstain from sinful desires and live good lives. And this means war. It's not war against, you know, taking up arms like those ancient kings of those days. There is a fierce and long battle and struggle right in our own hearts. There is a war against the, the guy or the girl or the man or the lady we see in the mirror. Go to the mirror and see it. It's the person you're supposed to battle against. In our nature, in our very heart of hearts, sometimes we don't want to belong to God. We don't want to be responsible to God. We want to be our own God in that sense. And we tend to rebel and live the way we want to live and believe things which are contrary to God. In other words, we are so tempted and prone to sin. We cannot deny that. The old Martin Luther, the leader of the Reformation, compared sinful desires to birds. He said this, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest there. Okay? They will fly over your head, but don't let them settle on your head to build a nest there. You will not be free from sinful desires until God and you ask God to bury the sinful desires and nature into the ground. So remember who you are. Remember Christ died to make you who you are. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 says, you're not your own, you're bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. And if you were to fail, if you were to fail, we can always come back to the cross and drop our sins at the foot of the cross Repent, confess, seek forgiveness, repent, and get up, refresh, and ready to continue the struggle. Now, be warned. People will notice this. The world which struggles with its own identity, the world do not know who they are. Today's world is just a, a world that is not just postmodernism, it's post truth. Truth is what you make it to be. And they would recognize you as something alien, a stranger in the darkness. And know that this good living thing that Peter refers to is not some sort of heroic act, you know, that we are to be heroes. You know. He's not calling us to solve poverty or end violence or leave our homes and families to march in the streets in protest. The church, especially, is not meant to do that. Of course, as a citizen, if there's injustice, you may want to express it. Yes, you can do it. Um, you know, but you must make sure that it is for a good cause, a godly cause, and a just cause. So, but the main work of the church is not to suddenly walk out into the streets of uh, where you are one day in, uh, in Bangsa Baru and uh, protest and do all kinds of violent acts. No. He's talking about living as a Christian in your average, everyday, normal life. So, if you read the rest of this letter which Paul has written in his first epistle, Peter, you will see what Peter is talking about. It talks about quiet submission to governmental authorities, respect for employers and supervisors, even the bad ones, unfortunately, honoring marriage. 
have a single married or single and living a gender in a way that glorifies God. Living a gender in a way that glorifies God. Today, they want you to have various kind of gender. And in general, carrying out whatever role, whatever role I mean, God has given you in life. So remember why you do it. It's not that the world may see your good works and applaud you and you know, clap for you and give you a standing ovation. It is so that the world may see your good deeds and glorify God. We seek not the, uh, the applause, as I always said, we seek not the applause of men, but the approval of God. So, we have a higher calling and a higher purpose in life. Now, let me conclude with these few, few things that should remind us. Do not look in the mirror for your true identity. Instead, as we, as we began this morning, this was just wonderful. I didn't, I didn't plan with your, with your Terence, you know, that he's supposed to sing this song. Instead, look to Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Let our Creator and Savior identify us. You know, so what are the characteristics that should mark our lives and separate us from the world? We are a chosen people with many privileges to be royal priests, a holy people, possession of God, and a people who have received mercy. Secondly, we are a, believing, a worshipping people. Thirdly, we are pilgrims who are waiting and seeking the kingdom of God. Fourthly, we are a people in battle, fighting against the flesh. So, from the day we have come to know the Lord, to our baptism, and finally to the grave, should the Lord tarry His coming, you are Christian. You are a citizen of the heavenly kingdom. You know, in TDDI, we had a refugee family from Pakistan. We walked with them for 10 years. They got registered themselves in the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. And they, were, they applied to, to a third country, the US. They waited and waited. And we walked with them, saw to their needs, provided for them and uh, children's education uh, for the, 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 uh, the Pakistani brother. To, uh, we started a business, a few of our church members start, a few of our church members started a business and so that he can have something to survive. And last December, he received finally a letter from the UNHCR that he has been approved to go to the US. And he left in the middle of December. You know, he was given just two weeks to get ready. And he's going, has gone there, he's left there, very happy, has sent us uh, photographs and uh, WhatsApp to us. And he's given a new citizenship. He'll be an American citizen. He was a refugee who fled from Pakistan when they wanted to kill him. And they left, the whole family left with just whatever they had quickly, and they came to Malaysia. And um, the Barnabas Fund contacted me, you know, and told me that they have this family and we, we, we reached out to them. And uh, one of our deacons uh, took them to the airport that morning on the 15th of December. And he said, you know, he said, you never know how much joy was in the heart that day at the airport. When they walked through the immigration, and then they took a photograph of them in the plane and sent to, to us by WhatsApp. Uh, our deacon says, you do not know the joy of freedom, the joy of a new citizenship, of a new life. For them, it was something that they had waited for so long. So the same thing with us. God has called us out of darkness to a life of purpose, to declare the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His wonderful light. Amen.